understand if you're sick, if you don't feel good, could you please, please call me back or at least pick up the phone. Let me know that everything's okay. It was a role change of sorts for these first responders. Rather than rolling up to medical calls, this team spent the afternoon moving boxes and furniture into this Aurora house. And it's all for this family, Dee Dee Blanchard and her 12-year-old daughter, Gypsy Rose. It's been a blessing. People have been so nice to us. It feels like we finally came home. It is wonderful. It's so beautiful and happy and homey. A home that this family was desperately in need of. Their trek to the Ozarks began when a St. John's medical team... During Hurricane Katrina, Dee Dee and Gypsy's home had been destroyed. And they had basically lost everything that they had. It was just a complete wash. So they were relocated up to Missouri, and they were basically here to just start over from scratch. We basically got out of there. When they said leave, we left. After weeks of staying in the hospital, Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose were then life lighted to St. John's in Springfield for care. Team leader Dr. The more that I got to know Dee Dee and Gypsy, the more I got to know about Gypsy's ailments. She had muscular dystrophy. She had a feeding tube. She suffered from severe migraines, and she was on a lot of different medications. She was unable to walk anywhere. I myself have picked her up and transported her between, you know, uh, couches and beds and vehicles. When I met her, she would have been 11 or 12. But Dee Dee told me that she had the mentality of like a four-year-old, somewhere around there. So she wasn't quite as developed as she seemed. With no home and Gypsy Rose battling both muscular dystrophy and leukemia, the St. John's Aurora team went to work securing this rent-free home for the family and cleaning it up. It is overwhelming. It's, you can never dream it in your wildest dream that so many people would just so generously come and help us and love us and just welcome us. For Gypsy Rose and her mother, the move brings a sense of security, a new town, and a new home that has welcomed them with open arms. It just proves that happy endings are not just in fairy tales, they're real and true in real life also. They couldn't drag me back to Louisiana kicking and screaming. I'm here to stay, we're home. Dee Dee treated everybody around her like family, which made it all the funnier that we shared a last name, but in no way were we actually blood related, but she could make you feel like you were. Every time we saw them, they were always happy and go lucky and wanted to help. And so we wanted to help them as well. Dee Dee had a lot of trouble asking for help, but they were actually given quite a bit of stuff, like trips to Disney World, Disneyland. They got the Habitat for Humanity house and the furniture in it and all that. We have an awesome bathtub. It's a um, jacuzzi tub meant for my muscles. And we have a wonderful ramp so I can get up and down by myself. The light switches, I can reach them now. I have wider doors so my chair can get through. They were given the van. And when the van died, they got another similar vehicle. Here's the keys to the house. Thank you. And here's the keys to the car that was donated. They were also given things like free flights to Gypsy's medical appointments or conferences. As far as Gypsy being sick, you almost wouldn't think that she was. A lot of people who had a lot less wrong with them would probably have done a lot more moaning and wailing about the whole thing. Here she is having tubes being put into her, having needles and treatments. And it was incredibly inspiring to see how Gypsy responded to these conditions. It was unreal. Hello, everybody. This is Gypsy Rose reporting from Aurora, Missouri. I am about to dive off our porch into the pile of snow. You ready? 
Gypsy had that really soft, high-pitched voice that kind of like made you feel like really nice and good. The normalcy of life that a child like Gypsy could could enjoy seemed to be very limited. So it was very important to Dee Dee for Gypsy to have a very fulfilled life before she passed. I did think their relationship was unique because of everything they did together. They even had a joint Facebook account called Djip Blanchard, and that's where Dee Dee would give updates on Gypsy's health and like take photos of her in the hospital or you know in Disney World. I mean, that was like the dream relationship between any mother and daughter. But I definitely feel like Gypsy did miss going to school so that she can, you know, make all those friends because you could tell that she wanted to have a life outside of her home. And so she had to live through fantasy. Anytime there was an opportunity for her to dress up, she would. If they were going to Comic-Con or if they were going to movie premieres, she would dress up as the characters. I just felt like she liked being someone else for a while. Especially when it came to like the hair, because she never really had any hair. And so she got to wear these beautiful long wigs and she took on this entire persona of someone that she could never be. We were friends and we were very friendly to each other, but we hadn't really gotten to know each other on like a real friendship level until she started messaging me. Gypsy had set up a secret Facebook account so that we could talk and she could vent, you know, without having to be filtered or censored by her mom because her mom was always present whenever we were hanging out together. Emma Rose was an alias that she used. She was just coming to me as like an older companion, you know, because she's only ever had her mom her entire life. And I figured I could be that friend that could be there and like listen to her and like share secrets with. And so she started calling me her big sis and I started calling her little sis. The Sunday that it all started was just a very typical Sunday. But then I see this post. It was from their DJIP Blanchard Facebook account. That was a very, a very jarring moment. I was like, well, that seems weird. I bet you they got their Facebook account hacked and somebody's been playing games with them. And then there's another post. So I called their phone, and they didn't pick up. At that point, I told Kim, we're just going to go over to the house. I was leaving messages on the machine. Dee Dee, could you please, please call me back, or at least pick up the phone? Let me know that everything's OK. When we got to Dee Dee and Gypsy's house, the car was in the driveway. Something didn't feel right. We walked up to the house and started knocking on the door, and nobody's answering. I knocked on the windows, and we shouted their names. At that point, I was starting to feel a little anxious, so I had Kim call the police department to see if they could come do a wellness check. 
When the police showed up, we realized that the kitchen window was actually unlocked. The police explained to us that since there doesn't appear to be a break-in of any kind, that there is no legal means for them to be able to just enter the property. So I asked them if there was going to be any reason why I couldn't go in the house, and I was told that would be OK. First thing that I noticed when I got inside, other than it being dark, is that it was extremely cold. It's like the air conditioner had been on full blast and just constantly running. And the house looked normal. I was just looking to see if I could find any people or anything that really just struck me as odd. You know, like overturned furniture, things that are broken. Gypsy's wheelchairs are still sitting in the living room and her electric wheelchair was in the bathroom. So that means all three of the wheelchairs that I knew that she had were in the house. In Gypsy's room, everything is just typical kid's room. Dee Dee's bed was unmade. There was a lot of blankets on it, but nothing looked out of sorts. when Dave told the cop what was in the house, which included all three of Gypsy's wheelchairs. I just knew that something was wrong. Patrol issued a statewide alert tonight about a mother and a daughter missing from Springfield tonight. They say 19-year-old Gypsy Blanchard and 48-year-old Claudinia Blanchard were last seen June 10th. If you know anything about their whereabouts, you're asked to call police right away. I saw a crowd of neighbors gathered up, and that's when I found out about the Facebook post. I thought maybe someone had just hack their account. But what made it strange was that nobody had seen them in a few days, and nobody could get a hold of them. Kim and I both felt that the police were doing their due diligence and trying to figure out where Dee Dee and Gypsy were. So we went home. to a phone call from a detective who said that he wanted to get some answers to some questions. I was surprised by him wanting to come over immediately, but I knew it had to be at least fairly serious. He asked me like how well I know Gypsy, how well I know Dee Dee, if they had any conflicts, but of course, I told him there was nothing crazy between them, and they were very, very close. He ended up getting a call. It was very short, and as soon as he disconnected, I just knew that something bad had happened. I wake up and turn on the news. The Greene County Sheriff has new information about a mother found murdered at her home and her missing daughter. Let's go live now to that neighborhood. 48-year-old Dee Dee Blanchard's body was found in her house late Sunday night. The sheriff isn't saying how she died, but has said her death was violent. Investigators continued searching for her daughter, 19-year-old Gypsy, through the night. One thing that worried friends and helped investigators with their case. I was floored. I didn't understand. I was in that house. How could I have missed something like that? The overall feeling was numbness. I, did, I didn't want to believe any of it. I wanted this to be anybody but Dee Dee. 
Dee Dee had been stabbed multiple times in the back, slashed across the back of her neck, and had been dead and alone in her house for at least a few days. This poor woman had done nothing but give her life for her child and had done nothing but love everybody around her. I could not think of anybody who would want to cause any kind of harm to Dee Dee and Gypsy. There was no suspect. There was nobody that anybody had any idea would be connected to this. And so all signs did just point to some random killer. Questions still surround Dee Dee's death. But the friends are asking everybody in the area to keep Dee Dee and Gypsy in their thoughts and prayers as this investigation moves forward. I just started sobbing. The Facebook posts were real. Dee Dee was dead. That meant Gypsy is too, and it's only a matter of time before we find her. At that point, all I wanted was Gypsy back home. The detective told me that he needed more information. So I told him I had these messages between Gypsy and I. I didn't know if there's any information in it that he could use, but little did I know that they were actually fairly vital pieces in finding out who had murdered Dee Dee. First, our conversations were very, very innocent. And then slowly she started opening up to me more about boys and like wanting advice on love and like kissing because she had never had her first kiss. It kind of shocked me because I wasn't expecting it, but at the same time, she was just getting older and she was, you know, 15, 16, and it just seemed totally normal for a girl her age to be asking these things. And then from there, it actually became like she had a love interest. Gypsy was not allowed to date boys. She was allowed to have friends. But boyfriends was completely out of the question. She immediately jumped into how they were planning on getting married and how they were going to get married in a gazebo in the snow. And this was my introduction to Nicholas Godajan. I told her, just be careful, play it safe, play it smart. Don't just run off with some stranger. Honestly, especially since he was from Wisconsin, I didn't think that anything would ever come of it. I thought that her mom had like enough control that there was nothing really to worry about at all. The police tracked the IP address of the Facebook status that was made on Dee Dee and Gypsy's Facebook account to a residential area in Big Bend, Wisconsin, Waukesha County. And the police determined that it was Nicholas's parents' home. When they figured out that the post had been made in Waukesha County, there was no way that they could get there in time because they were eight or nine hours away. So they had to ask the local police department to go to the residence and see if Gypsy was there. They dispatched a very large group of police officers and they descended on the house prepared for anything. I felt like we were going to end up finding Gypsy, you know, in a similar condition they found Dee Dee. This 
This is a KY3 special report. A huge break in this homicide investigation. We've just learned that 19-year-old Gypsy Rose Blanchard has been found safe. She is okay. She has been found in another state and that also a person of interest is in custody. Detectives are right now heading to that state to get in touch with Gypsy Rose and this person of interest in the case. We will give you more updates online and have live reports coming up today on KY. To hear that she had been found in Wisconsin alive unharmed. It was one ray of hope. I was relieved that she was found, but you know, what condition was she in? Like, what did she go through? It says Nicholas. Do you go by Nick? Nicholas, something different? Um, I prefer, uh, usually by my family I'll be called Nicholas, but by friends and uh, other people I usually be called Nick. Either. What would you like for me to call you when I'm talking uh, to you? Uh, Nick. Nick, okay. And so is that the first time that your mom ever met your girlfriend? Yeah, Okay. Yeah. I guess she's your girlfriend, Jim, she's your yeah, girlfriend. Yes, she is, yes, yeah, she is. And you love her? Oh, do I love her. So we're gonna go down two paths here, okay? And that is just, you're gonna have to be honest with me. Oh. Because if you love her, if you love Gypsy, then you're not gonna let Gypsy get in trouble without you being there to help her, okay? I understand. Um, your mom's dead, okay? Now, what I wanna ask you Wait, well, is, what, what, what? Your, your mom's your mom's passed away, okay? And she's deceased, all right? Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you want to um, do the right thing by Gypsy if you love her? Well, the truth is I worship her, so I know there's, you there's do. no way, there's no way I wouldn't do it wrong. I know. I thank her. No. Yeah, hang on, hang on, listen to me for just a second, okay? Police did a search of Nicholas's bedroom, and they found a large amount of cash that had been stolen from Dee Dee's bedroom, as well as an envelope that had been mailed from the Springfield location with the murder weapon inside. The truth is, okay, I'll admit it. I did actually Stay up, come on. I will make it. I know. Okay. What happened with your mom that night? I don't know. I don't feel like that at all. <laughs> okay, you. Me. I, the only reason I did it is because I did it for me and her. That's the real reason I did it. I would have never did it if it was not for me and her. Okay. I do you love my mom. I know you do. Sweetheart, I have no doubt that you love your mom. <laughs> I don't know. Why did they hurt her? Didi's full name was Claudine and Petrie, but everyone called her Didi. Hey, dude. There were six of us, three older brothers, and my oldest sister. I was the fifth child, and Didi was the sixth child. She was considered the baby. Didi went out of her way to be different by herself, a loner, and that's what she liked. You know, you don't know that she's got a short, a jacket, but she's got a short. She got the fire. Today's Friday, that's why she's going to see the boys tonight. And that's your daddy, of course. I'm at the bowling alley, uh, hanging out one night, going there to hear a band, and I see this girl, she's, uh, she looks a little different. She doesn't look like she's from around here. Hi, my name is Dee. We're about to leave to go out. Me and Suzette and LJ and Michelle and Titania. And we're going to go do some tricks. Tonight, we're not treating anyone. This is how I look. Turn around. The way she dressed and then carried herself. Designed by Dee. She, was, she stood out from the crowd, definitely. You the bad witch or the good witch? She's the good one, I'm the bad one, okay? We straighten those things out already. Yeah. I was 17 years old, I was, I was wild as a weed, you know? <laughs> she 
She was a little older than me, but I got her phone number and we started dating after that. She told me one morning that, that she's got some news that she's pregnant. So I was like, really, already, already? <laughs> right away I said, well, I guess we're gonna get married. She was the perfect Southern wife, a really nice girl, very polite, very generous, but I just never developed that, that special place in my heart for her. We was married only three months. I promised her I would always do everything I could to take care of her and the child, to do what I can for them financially and, and mentally, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't stay. We named her Gypsy Rose Blanchard. She may have been a little small, but by all means, she was she was a normal little little baby. I nicknamed her Possum because she looked like a little possum, little bitty possum eyes, little bitty blonde blonde hair that stuck up all the time. She was so tiny. As soon as I saw her, I knew my life was was going to be different forever. But I had no idea what what I was about to take on. As she got older, Dee Dee tells me that she's trying to get her this heart monitor that she'd have to wear while she slept because she stopped breathing in her sleep and she'd have, or she'd have seizures in the middle of the night. And she was telling me she was bringing her for tests and everything and that she had sleep apnea. She acted so scared. Well, wave goodbye to me. She didn't want nobody watching her. The only one she would let babysit Gypsy was my mom and my dad. I didn't even get to babysit her because she was sick. Gypsy? Gypsy? Do you want to go play outside? No. She wouldn't even leave her f with me for an hour or anything, so she was with her all the time. How old are you? You're one. And where's your cranial? Very good. And where's your fin jelly? Yes. Very, very good. Didi was a great mom. I tell her all the time, man, I don't know how you do it, you know, day in and day out, taking care of uh, Gypsy, being there for her. Hi, we're poofing. Just a smidge. It's Gypsy Rose Blanchard. Gypsy is four years old. And we're in Golden Meadow. I thought she was the best mom in the world. Close, close, close to your face. Ooh, give me that big smile now so I can see just your face. When Gypsy was around four, five, six, Dee Dee started telling me that she's got some problems with her eyes, seizures. She would say that the seizures would affect her eyes, so they would conduct a surgery where they would straighten her eye out, and then she would have another seizure and her eye would get crooked again. Ooh, it looks like you're right there in my camera. Whoa, all I can see is just your glasses now. Dee Dee was telling me that when she'd have these seizures, it would knock her back mentally um, a couple years. Go. Oh, her and E.T. slip and fall. Can I get up? As Gypsy's uncle, you always want the best. You feel sad. You want him to have a normal, healthy life. But with Gypsy, that never really happened. It just got worse and worse. Dee Dee started telling me, they're running tests, they're trying to find out what's going on with her. She's got a lot of issues. She had some problems with her hearing. She needed to get some, some tubes put in her ears. She had a bad problem with, with reflux. So seven or eight, she had the uh, feeding tube put in and she's being fed with, with this machine to her feeding button. Over here, baby. It got to a point where Dee Dee was taking care of Gypsy 24-7, so she didn't work at all anymore. I promised her I would always pay her child support along with alimony and cover all medical expenses and health insurance for Gypsy. 
I paid Didi until the day she died. When Gypsy was around seven, that was the first time I saw her in a wheelchair. They came over for a visit, her and Didi. I would ask her, what's wrong with her, her legs? Is, is it really that bad? What's the diagnosis? Didi told me that she's got muscular dystrophy, that her, her, her legs muscles are going to uh, eventually quit working. That is terrifying to hear, hear that about your child. After that first time I saw her in a wheelchair, I've never, never seen her walk again. But through all the illnesses, she's, she's always been a trooper. She's always been all smiles. You can look through all the pictures we have. There's not many sad pictures of Gypsy. She's always got a smile. They moved to Thibodeau, which is 45 minutes away. A couple years later, they moved to New Orleans, a couple hours away. As she got older, they moved further and further and further away. It got harder and harder to see her. I'd go to their house and visit a uh, couple hours, hang out. But when Gypsy and I would start building a little closeness, a little bond and everything, it'd be a three or four months before we can get back together and rebuild upon that. It seemed like Didi was never letting us build that that father-daughter relationship that you're supposed to have with your children. And Katrina hit in uh, 2005, and they were relocated to Missouri. That's 11 hours away. By that point, she let me talk to Gypsy on the phone whenever I wanted and everything, but she said a visit was pretty much out of the question. I never raised any really hard questions with Dee Dee because she still allowed me to talk to her when we called and, and, and keep some kind of relationship. I knew that if I raised any serious questions or issues, she could cut me off in a minute. So the relationship we had was mostly just phone calls, gifts, birthday cards, stuff like that. I just wanted to try to make her feel like you know, I'm going to be here for you forever, waiting. One day you're going to call me and say, hey, Dad, it's Gypsy. You know, can you come see me or, or something? You know, I was just ho ho hoping for that day to come, and it never came. What happened with your mom that night? Um, I don't know. What happened with my mom? Okay, you did Gypsy know? that you were going to kill her mother. Um, just listen to me, okay, sweetheart? You, you know what happened to your mom, okay? And I know that you know. Honestly, she asked me to. So Gypsy knew you were going to kill her mother because Gypsy asked you to. Yes. Why did she ask you to do that? Did you kill your mom? No, no, sir. Did you help? No, sir. Nicholas, kill your mom? No, sir. Sir. Did you have knowledge that Nicholas was going to kill your mom yes, before he did it? No, sir. Okay, good morning. Uh, I want to specify at the beginning of this press conference that says this is an ongoing investigation. The prosecutor has filed charges this morning for first degree murder on two suspects. We're still investigating the extent of the relationship, but it has been referred to as boyfriend, girlfriend. I was blown away. I never in a million years would have thought she would have ever been associated with something like that. I mean, any sort of crime, period, but especially the murder of her own mother. I was like, what is going on here? 
as far as I knew, they had the perfect mother-daughter relationship. I mean, it was the perfect little happy family. The police must have gotten somebody's story backwards or somebody wasn't telling the whole truth, but it couldn't be Gypsy. 26-year-old Nicholas Gutejohn was in a Waukesha County courtroom this morning. He waived his right to an extradition hearing. He's charged in the Missouri murder of Dee Dee Blanchard. Prosecutors say he stabbed the woman to death after the victim's daughter, Gypsy, allegedly asked him to. Gutejohn also has a criminal past. In 2013, he was arrested after investigators say he was watching pornography and fondling himself in a McDonald's restaurant for nine hours. Police finding a large knife during the arrest. I think everyone assumed that he was just this internet predator that had, you know, preyed on Gypsy, especially given her circumstances. Uh, I want to talk to you just a little bit about what's going on, okay? Okay. As you know, Nicholas was charged with first degree murder yeah. and um, armed criminal action. And what he, um, what happened is, is he got a bus ticket yeah. and he came to Springfield, which is where I live, New yeah. York. And he, um, he and Gypsy conspired to kill her mother. Um, he stabbed her numerous times in the back while she slept in her bed. I mean, what what do you think about this? I don't know. I mean, I know that once he started going down there, we always keep a close watch on him because he has autism, you know, he okay. Asperger's. And that's Is why he being diagnosed with autism yeah. and, and yes. Asperger's? Yes. Okay. Last doctor he talked to, they said his mind is probably always going to be 15, 16, right around there. Okay. He's never done anything like this. Not, nothing violent, you know what I mean? That's why I'm in shock. Okay. I don't when I think he's madly in love with this I know, girl. I know. I do remember thinking that it was go to John who was a mastermind behind it all. But it slowly came to light that through talking with the detectives and seeing the the news broadcast that there was a lot more that we weren't aware of. At any time during any of this whole situation that's happened, did um, Gypsy ever have to be in a wheelchair? Um, yes. Okay, when was that? That was uh, only when she was living at home. Okay. Otherwise, she could walk. So when she was with you this whole time, she hasn't had to have a wheelchair? Nope. We also know that she can walk without assistance or a wheelchair. Um, and she can do that very well. Nicholas Gaiza versus Gypsy Blanchard, case number 15, CF755, assigned to Judge Boyd. When I saw her walking in the court, I was in shock. I was freaked out. I couldn't believe it. I cocked my head and was like, that's not her. And I had to rewind multiple times just for it to truly sink in that she is actually walking into the courtroom up to a podium. It didn't seem real. What is this Blanchard's current address? 2103 West Volunteer Way, Springfield, Missouri, 65803. I had spent so much time worrying about her and about her condition. And I never knew that she could walk. And then she was walking across the TV. And she was fine. The individual is alleged to have conspired with Nicholas Gorgia to stab her mother to death so that they could be together. I refused, flat out refused, to believe that this was happening. It wasn't my gypsy. I've never seen her out of her wheelchair. That's unheard of. Let's just say she was really good at acting. I thought for sure that she really was crippled. I started to doubt everything that I ever knew about them. One time she's looking just as Mr. Gordy got this, two felony charges. Most significant one being first degree murder or the penalty is life imprisonment. For example, $40 million cash bail conditions are that the defendant had no contact 
with Nicholas Gordijan. A lot of questions started popping in my head about what was real over the last 23 years of her life. It seems like a huge rabbit trail that we're following to see if uh, anything is true. Until questions are answered, people will be left wondering who the real mother and daughter really were. I thought I knew these people so well. Even Blanchard's true age is a mystery. If she could walk, she knew she could walk. How deep did the lie go? Everybody that I had ever met in my life, I kept thinking about their faces and how hurt they must have been to find out that these two people that they had cared so much for were not who they thought. I would describe my relationship with my mother as complicated. When I was younger, it was a lot better just because she was like a best friend to me. You wanna blow me a kiss? Very good. I love you. We used to do things together all the time. Go to the movies, go to the park, the zoo. When I was probably about five or six, my mother told me that I had epilepsy and that I was paralyzed from the waist down. She said I had cancer and she would shave off my hair and tell me it's gonna fall out anyway, so let's keep it nice and neat. She would also say that I couldn't eat and that I needed a feeding tube. And so I would have formula through the feeding tube and I'd also receive my medication through the feeding tube. I'm not sure all the names of the medication that my mom was making me take, but there was a lot of ones that basically just put me under a sedative state. The medications did affect my teeth. They started to deteriorate, and some of them had to be extracted. So where are you going today? I'm going to Children's Mercy Hospital to see my dentist for my teeth. I had many, many surgeries. And we'll be back soon. I've had my salivary glands removed because my mother said that I drooled. I had the feeding tube placement in my tummy. I had multiple eye surgeries on my right and left eye, um, ear surgeries, um, a muscle biopsy to find out why my legs didn't work, and um, a surgery to make me not throw up anymore. I believed I had all these illnesses, except that I knew I could walk, and I knew that I could eat. It wasn't until I saw my attorney for the first time, and he tells me that there's been no medical records that says I have cancer, and it shocked me. I, I don't have cancer? It confused me so much. So what other illnesses don't I have? He tells me, for the most part, he thinks I'm perfectly healthy and that a lot of this is made up. I was happy to know that I, I'm perfectly healthy, but at the same time, it hurt because it's like my whole world had been tossed up and I realized that my mother wasn't who I thought she was. It's the newest development in the murder case against Gypsy Blanchard and her boyfriend, Nicholas Godijan. Gypsy's mother apparently kept Gypsy in a wheelchair, making up her illnesses and disabilities. Gypsy's mom was 
abusing her physically, medically, giving her medication she didn't need, having her go through procedures that she didn't need, to the point where most of Gypsy's teeth are not even hers because of the medication that her mom was giving her that uh, she had no condition for. Well, she'll please have not guilty to each account. I remember just being nauseous. Just wanting to turn away from it all and just throw up. I've felt empty. I've felt cold. I felt numb. I felt guilty. Like I've literally felt everything. We are really trying to, to get an, a sense of the overall picture and to find out exactly how widespread Gypsy's, uh, her mother's control was over her. As soon as I was aware of the case, I started searching the internet and trying to acquire all the information I could. And it became one of the least difficult cases I've ever seen in establishing this as much as my proxy, which is when people make others under their control either sick or lie about their illnesses or exaggerate their illnesses, all to get some kind of emotional gratification for themselves. Young lady, Gypsy Rose Blanchard, and her mother, Dee Dee Blanchard, from Springfield, Missouri, to this day. Dee Dee was a woman of fairly few accomplishments. There were relatively few things that distinguished her from the run of the mill person, and that didn't suit her. So, having a sick child gave her a sense of identity, which was of the indefatigable, heroic caregiver who left others breathless with the excellence of her child rearing. And I always said, you're the reason I was born to be your mom. It all makes sense now. You know, why she kept Gypsy at such a distance from me all of these years, why they moved so far away. She didn't want Gypsy to develop any kind of relationship with anybody that might take her away from her. I felt so stupid. Like, why couldn't I see through this? Why, 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 is all I kept asking myself. I've seen, at this point, hundreds of cases, but every once in a while we see a case that veers into what we call malingering by proxy, where the perpetrator is after financial remuneration. And I think they were combined in this case. Over the years, Dee Dee and Gypsy Blanchard received money and assistance from a long list of charities across the nation. Churches in their hometown of Thibodeau, Louisiana held fundraisers. That's when I started to get angry. At that point, I knew that I had been duped for many years. and. Just completely felt taken advantage of. The amount of money that Didi scammed through people, different organizations, surely it's in the thousands and thousands of dollars. Didi scammed me personally for at least $150,000 between unnecessary medical expenses and child support that, that I continued to pay after she turned 18. Didi wasn't a stranger to the law. She shoplift. She was wanted for writing bad checks. She stole from many of people. She would get so many credit cards and then eat my dead mother's name and run up the bills like crazy. She was gonna do anything, any way, anyhow to get her way. All of this combined really altered my view of Dee Dee. I mean, once I started realizing the extent of what she did and her actions, I started realizing how cruel she was and how she allowed her daughter to be essentially tortured constantly for all of her life. Dee Dee had a couple years of college under her belt to, to be a nurse and she worked in the hospital. She did her research on whatever disease she was gonna fathom that Gypsy had. 
there's something wrong with the medical system if a child could get through being untreated or overtreated year after year after year. Mm, makes me mad. Dee Dee got away with this for so long because she is like so many Munchausen by proxy perpetrators. They don't encounter that much resistance. Doctors are businessmen and they like satisfied consumers. So I think the easiest thing for them to do is ignore the possibility of Munchausen by proxy and just go on and treat and treat and treat for whatever ailments the mother claims the child has. She had a very persuasive personality. On the outside, you would almost think that she's just the kindest, sweetest, most genuine woman. She would give me a stuffed animal or a doll to play with, and she would just tell me to keep quiet. You know, if the doctor asked me how I was doing, say fine. But other than that, don't talk. And if she found that the doctor didn't agree with what she wanted, or if they didn't put me on a certain medication or did do a certain surgery, she would switch to a different doctor that she would find that would. I've probably seen over 100 doctors in my life. Around August 2007, uh, Gypsy came with her mother for a neurological assessment. Uh, from what I knew and I remember, she moved from Louisiana. She was a Katrina survivor, and I was told that this girl has a sad story, and the community kind of uh, adopt her and they embrace her. I always like to ask uh, questions to the patient, but at the time, the interaction was mainly with the mother. She says she has uh, muscular dystrophy, and she has cerebral palsy, that she had a seizure disorder or epilepsy. And so I asked for Gypsy's medical records, but Gypsy's mother said she doesn't have no records because everything got lost in the storm. Because there were no records to be obtained or requested, I had to base uh, trust and rely on what the mother told me at the time. But the volume of her muscles were normal. They were well-sized and her reflexes were normal, meaning that it kind of didn't make sense that she would not be able to walk. So she was referred to have an MRI of the spine to see if there could be anything that I'm missing. And it was completely normal. So I told mom that I don't see any reason why she shouldn't be able to stand up and walk where she was mad. She said, that's, that, that's not true. She cannot walk, that's a fact. And said she was not coming back. When her reaction was not as expected, I said that I have a suspicion that this is not real. This is fabricated or exaggerated. That's when I said that this is suspicious of Munchausen by proxy. So my duty was to tell the pediatrician in my report. The pediatric neurologist who raised the notion of Munchausen by proxy had a powerful responsibility to Gypsy. By virtue of his even considering the diagnosis means he needed to pick up the phone and call Child Protective Services. And he failed to do so, as did other doctors. If I would have reported her, I believe that the mother would have convinced them that what I'm saying is not true. I needed more to be able to report them to child services. If you have a reasonable suspicion that you're making in good faith, you are protected and required to make the report. Having seen what happened, if I see in the future another Minchhausen by proxy, I probably should be more aggressive. I never heard anything about the Munchausen by proxy. Didn't even know what it was. When we found out what it really was all about, that's when we realized Dee Dee's doing to Gypsy what mom did to her.
When Didi was born, my mom said that she came along with all these sicknesses, heart murmur and stuff like that. My mom would always make us go play outside, and it was like, oh, well, your sister's not feeling good. Your sister's got an upset stomach. She's got a headache. Y'all go play outside, be quiet, leave her alone, you know? As she got older, Didi couldn't get excited. Didi couldn't jump around. She couldn't play outside. She couldn't overheat herself. She was not allowed to assist with chores. If Didi didn't want to do it, well, then she didn't have to because the heart murmur. It was used like a crutch for a long time. But Didi was basically not as sick as it was to believe. My mom smothered her. She didn't want her to grow up. She wanted to keep her young so that she would always have her to hold on to. Our bedroom was where all of us kids slept, but Dee Dee always slept with my mama. It's like she was her shadow, always by my mama's side, always. Yes, I get a boy. That's your boy. This mine too? Your boy and your ring. Hi, mama. Oh, wait. How you doing, man? What's that, mama? Some, some green. Some green. Green machine. Yes, Marino. Say what? We didn't get to go to college, but Didi went to college. We didn't get a car when we were growing up. Didi got the car. That's what daddy's fixing for her to go in tonight. Dino says she needs a new one. We knew if you wanted something, you had to go out and earn it. But Didi just wanted it and got it. Didi was into beauty pageants, and my mama went out and bought her the prettiest dress, the prettiest shoes. She was just all about the attention. When my mom passed away, Didi took it hard. You know, the person who babied her all her life wasn't there anymore. Say hi. But she still needed the attention. It didn't matter how, as long as it was coming. I feel sorry for Gypsy. I feel sorry for the way she was raised. But I'm extremely upset that Gypsy didn't trust any of us that she couldn't say something to us because all of this could have ended differently. I just don't know like what I was doing to make her feel like I couldn't do something. I don't know what made her resist like just opening up and just telling me what was going on. If I'd had any indication that she needed any kind of help, uh, I would have been over there in a heartbeat. But never been able to make Gypsy feel like she can call me when there was something wrong growing up like that. So I feel pretty bad about that. I couldn't just jump out of the wheelchair because, to be honest, I was afraid of what my mother might do. And I didn't think that I had anyone to trust. I couldn't trust Aaliyah because my mother was starting to put things in my head that Aaliyah wasn't my true friend and that she was a bad influence on me, so I couldn't be friends with her anymore. And I didn't reach out to my dad because I grew up with my mom saying all these horrible things about him, that he abandoned us, that he didn't love me or her, that he didn't want anything to do with me. So I thought, he wouldn't care, so why reach out to him? If I had known then what I know now, I would have reached out to anybody for help. But I was too afraid to. They said it's snowing, so I'm staying under my heating blanket. <laughs> and I'm not getting out. <laughs> As I was growing up, I wanted more independence 
and that just wasn't okay with her. She wants to get out. Ain't gonna happen. Let her dog take care of her. Oh! I asked my mother, can we please get rid of the feeding tube? I don't need it. And she said no. Can I please maybe get some physical therapy to help me walk a little bit better? And she just said no. I think I started to piece things together when I came across a Medicaid card and it said that I was born in 1991 and not 1995 like she had claimed and told me. So I was actually 19 at the time, not 15. After everything went down, I found out that Dee Dee changed her birth certificate several times. She was born in 91, she changed a one to a five. So she took four years off of her life right there. Dee Dee had so much to lose by letting her understand she was 18. You know, she knows that Gypsy could have just got up and walked out. She had met this guy at this sci-fi convention, and she told him what was going on, that she was trying to get away from her mom, that she needed some help. I trusted him a little bit, enough to run away from home. He didn't have a place of his own, so he was staying with a friend. Those friends knew my mom. They called my mom, and my mom came to get me. She told him that I was 15, so he freaked out because he was 36 at the time. My mother brought me back with her, smashed my computer. She chained me to a bed, tinted the windows so nobody could see what was going on inside the house and put bells on the doors. So if I tried to sneak out again, she could hear. I had asked her, you know, if I can go to the bathroom. She didn't chain me, take me to the bathroom, but then chain me back up to the bed. She would starve me. She would hit me with a coat hanger. And she would call me bitch, slut, whore, devil spawn. For about two weeks, that happened. <laughs> I went from looking at her like a loving parent to seeing her as somebody that I was quite afraid of. I felt like there was no hope. I just kept thinking, dear God, get me out of here somehow. I first met Nick on a Christian dating website in 2012. I believe it was October. I messaged him, he messaged me back. I was able to carry it on by sneaking on to my mother's computer while my mother was asleep. And we started to talk about our lives and we liked each other from the very beginning. I did tell him um, that I was in a wheelchair from the get-go, and um, he seemed accepting. He was like, it doesn't matter to me. I love you all the same. It was just different to find somebody that accepted me. Um, even though I knew I could walk, I still thought that it was nice of him to accept me as I am. Things progressed um, kind of quickly. We met uh, one week online and then became like a couple the next week. About a year into our relationship, I told him that I could walk. He was not surprised at all. Um, he claimed to have psychic abilities. And he started to tell me that 
he had multiple personality disorder and that he had several. And one of them was named Victor, and Victor was the violent one. The thing is, is that I have more than one person inside me. There's actually multiple personalities of myself. Have you been diagnosed with that? I probably should be diagnosed with it because it happens. The thing is, I used to take a medication. Okay. I used to hear voices in my head. Okay. And it went away, and then it somehow went as part of myself. Okay. So, does Gypsy know that? Yes. Okay. She does know that. Okay. I started to be a little bit more scared. But at the same time, I was desperate for affection. So I made up personalities to match his. One of them I created was um, Candy, and she had like rainbow-colored hair. Another one was Ruby. That was to match Victor. I would have done pretty much anything just to make him stay, make him happy. But then soon my mother started to lock her computer, so I stole a cell phone and can't make any calls or anything, but I hooked it up to the Wi-Fi of the house. And I was able to talk to Nick that way through Facebook and other social media. We thought that it was time to meet up face to face. And so I came up with the idea, you know, let's meet up at a movie theater. Let's pretend like we don't know each other and we'll bump into each other, make friends, and I thought, if he dressed nice, if he said all the right things, if he was just a kind person, but my mom would think, hey, well, why not? This be the one, and then that way we don't have to lie and hide our relationship anymore. I had picked a movie, and it was Cinderella, the new version. Um, I thought it was, that it was perfect. So we got our bus ticket and he came to Springfield to finally meet me. He just struck up a conversation with my mom in the movie theater and she thought that he was creepy and gave off a sort of dangerous vibe. So she moved down a couple of seats and told me to follow her. I didn't. We planned it all out from the beginning that it was time for me to lose my virginity. So I told my mom that I was going to the bathroom and he followed me. I always imagined like, you know, rose petals and candles and, you know, romance, but it was none of those things. My mother started to worry. So she came out of the auditorium and just in the nick of time, we were by concessions. My mother told me, why are you still hanging out with that guy? And that led to an argument and I'm like, he, he's not doing anything wrong. He just wants to be my friend. Now, why can't I have friends? She took me to the bathroom and she slapped me. It made me feel devastated that it all went wrong because I knew that mom's never gonna let me be happy, have friends, fall in love, get married, have kids, have a normal life. And I never wanted any more than that. I got scared and desperate. And the only thing that I can think about was I want this ideal life of freedom and happiness. How can I get it? And then me and Nick were talking one night and he said that he would do anything to protect me. And I asked him anything and he said, yeah. From anybody, he said, yeah. Even my mom, he said, yes. And that's when this kind of plan started to develop of a murder plot.
You have a collect call from an inmate at Green County Jail. To accept charges, press one. So, uh, she first asked me, How badly do you want to be with me? Told her I'll be, I'll do anything to be with her, you know that. And she said, as long as my mom's alive, I can't be with you. She made that very clear. I felt, how else am I gonna escape? It seemed like taking her out of the equation completely was the only option. That was like, are you serious? not anything to joke around about. And she said that this is the only way we can be together. So I'm pretty much stuck on this situation and I just end up following along with it. We started looking at some different poisons. We went looking at arson, pretend that a candle fell in the bedroom and caught fire. And we went looking at a gun, but then I finally told him, I can't kill her. I, I don't have it in me to kill her. And he said, well, you know, if you can't kill her, who's going to do it? And I said, could you? I was really shocked. She said, if you truly love me, you'd be willing to do this for me because you know this is the only way we can be together. And at some point, I ended up giving in because I didn't know what else to do. There's nothing I wouldn't do for her. There's truly nothing I wouldn't do. He said that he was very good with knives, and I said I wanted it to be painless. I didn't want her to suffer because she's still my mother. We thought that we would never get caught. I felt like this is a fairy tale, and I was going to be the princess that gets rescued. And then I'd be happy in Wisconsin, where I'd be loved, and I'd have my freedom, and I'd have this wonderful new life. It would start it as a fairy tale, ended as a horror movie. Um, your mom's dead, OK? Now, what I want to ask you Wait, is, what, what? Your, your, mom's, your mom's passed away, OK? She's deceased, all right? Just, you know, hang on, hang on, listen to me for just a second, okay? I was excited just to be with her for the rest of my life. And I believe that's what she wanted. was that he would put on the gloves and come in. And all I had to do was just go in the bathroom and keep quiet. Hang on, hang on, hang on listen to me for just a second, OK? What happened with your mom that night? I basically had two thoughts pop in my head. One was take her and run. The other was, this bitch is dead. She's not going to get between me and her. Listen to me, okay, sweetheart? You, you know what happened to your mom, okay? 
be okay. And I know that you know. I loved her so deeply that from the first step I walked into the house, I knew there was no going back. I covered my ears so I wouldn't hear anything. But I still heard my mother scream. And at that point, I thought, hey, I don't want this to happen. I want this to stop now. But I was too afraid to go and help. You think that hearing a murder is like what you hear on a horror film or something, but it's, it's really not. You can stand watching a horror film, but hearing someone actually being murdered is terrifying. It creates this almost nauseous feeling in your stomach. You can't think. All you can think about is how afraid you are. I can't do my life, I know you do. Now's the time to be truthful, sweetheart. No more lies. Then a couple of minutes, she stopped screaming. Nick came in and he was holding the knife in blood. He ordered me to patch up his finger because he cut his finger on the knife. And then he ordered me to clean up little droplets of blood that was left in the hall and the bathroom. Did you kill your mom? No, no, sir. Did you help? No, sir. Nicholas, kill your mom? No, sir. My mother had a money pouch. Little did I know that it was my dad sending child support. So we took it. And that's how we paid for everything. We packed a couple of things in my suitcase. We called a cab, and we went back to the hotel that he was staying at. I was happy, because I was free. Mm. Hi, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling <doing> it. <laughs> but the looming awareness of what had just happened clouded my mind. So I used pills to drown out all of my remorse and cares <laughs> and fears. I left a motel with him and we went to the bus stop. He wanted me to first carry the knife with me onto the ground bus, but I assumed that they had metal detectors. So I suggested, let's mail the knife. I thought it was the safest option. And then we took a Greyhound bus back to Wisconsin. found because I felt remorse and I couldn't stand the thought of her just being there. But I needed something alarming that would alarm her friends to call the police. And then one morning we wake up to the sound of police. We were surrounded. I think the last thing that I said to him is that we're going to stick together. I did that for her and only for her, not just for us. It's a tight thing to quit.
This is in the case of State of Missouri v. Gypsy Rose Blanchard, case number 1531CR03591, appearing for the State is Mr. Patterson. State's Exhibit 53, the LG phone was taken from the black bag in the bedroom and had Gypsy's identification. Correct. I don't blame her for what she done. Everyone failed Gypsy. From down, from myself, her mother, the doctors, the police, social services. We all looked out for ourselves. We wasn't totally looking out for her. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. I held on to Gypsy's innocence until the day she pleaded. My brain would not wrap around that she had this capacity, had this rage, and that broke my heart because I had to admit that nothing that I knew was right. How do you plead to the Class A felony of murder in the second degree? Guilty. Prosecuting attorney Dan Patterson says while Gypsy is guilty of murder, the amended charge fairly and justly holds her accountable to the law while also taking into account the extreme mitigating circumstances of nearly two decades of systematic abuse by her mother. The court accepts the defendant's plea of guilty to the Class A felony of murder in the second degree and finds the defendant guilty thereof. When I think about what Dee Dee did to Gypsy, it makes me sad, but they didn't really have to kill my sister. They could have just ran away together, but they chose to go a different route and my sister got killed. Well, not killed, murdered. No matter what happens, I'm always going to love her unconditionally. No matter what happens, it doesn't matter if we break off, it doesn't matter what happens. I'm always going to love her unconditionally. To this day, I still do love her. I do love her. And I know for a fact that she still does love me. Now that I've grown and matured, I know the difference between love and infatuation. He wants to feel whatever he wants to feel, but I don't love him no more. After Gypsy had been transferred to Chillicothe, she ended up calling me one evening. She immediately started apologizing for everything, and then she started carrying on about how she's learning to do her hair, and like she's learning to do her makeup, and she's making friends. I mean, honestly, it sounds like she's just away for college. And I feel like, as sad as it may sound, her story really does finally have a happy ending, at least for her. I have a lot of complicated emotions for my mother. There are some times that I'm angry at her. There are times that I think that she is so manipulative and how could you do that to your child? And then I think about other times where I'm like, she just was so desperate for, for somebody to love her. But regardless of all of that, I still love her and I still miss her because she was my mother. <laughs>